Hi, everybody. You're listening to It's All About Food. Welcome for joining me today. I am here with Dr. Vanita Raman, who is a board-certified physician in internal medicine. She is the clinic director at the Barnard Medical Center, where she leads clinical research, conducts nutrition education programs, and provides patient care. She's also a certified nutritionist and personal trainer. Dr. Raman lives with her family outside of Washington, D.C. Welcome, Dr. Raman, to It's All About Food. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you. I love doctors that promote a healthy plant diet and also know how to cook. (laughs) (laughs) You would think they'd go hand in hand, right? (laughs) Well, I think in the future it will. I've seen a few videos with medical students in in kitchens learning how to cook. I I know that's not the norm, but it's encouraging. Definitely. But I think you're right that in the future, things may change. There are a lot of medical schools that are now employing teaching kitchens, uh, medical kitchens, really. It's such a wonderful way to teach students and also to connect with the community and patients love it. Now, a good thing about what you're doing is that what you've learned and what you bring to your parents comes from personal experience. So let's start with that how you got started in plant-based nutrition and wanted to share it with people. Yeah. You know, for me, it's uh, I've had my own health struggles uh, and I grew up in India and I moved Mm -hmm. here when I was 12. And when I lived in India, I ate a pretty healthy vegetarian diet, um, played outside and I was lean and wasn't really thinking about anything. And then when I was 12, I moved to the DC area and everything changed. I wasn't playing outside anymore. I was playing video games and my diet changed. I was eating Mm. cheese, something I didn't even like at first. You know, the first time I bit into cheese, I didn't like it. But soon I was hooked and I was eating it on my pizza, on my sandwiches, everything. And I was consuming cookies and soda and chips and ice cream. And even um, though I grew up vegetarian, I wanted to fit in. So I would try to eat meat um, so I could be like the other kids. And well, you know, all that had a big toll on my health and I soon gained weight and I was chubby and just not a healthy kid at all at that point. And your parents, were they encouraging you to be American and be like Americans and eat the way Americans eat? Yeah, you know, I think in their own way they were. Um, and, and the reason was when we were in India, we had very modest means. So things like soda and cookies and ice cream were really cost prohibitive. So uh, and then once we got here, these things were so cheap, uh, relatively speaking, mm-hmm. compared to what they were like in India. And, you know, they were common, whereas over there, they were a special treat. And and so my parents felt happy that they could give me those things that they couldn't afford to give me before. But of course, they didn't know that they were not healthy to begin with. And it was really having a very negative impact on my health. I liked when you said that you were eating more cheese in the United States and that you got hooked. And I don't think that language is unintentional. We know that dairy is addictive. We know that cheese especially has those casomorphines and people do get literally addicted, hooked. Yeah, it's, it's so true. I, you know, I was, I remember the first time I had pizza, I didn't necessarily care for it. The first time I had a grilled cheese, I really didn't like it. Uh, But soon I, like everyone else, I liked that zing I got, the salt, the fat, the casomorphines. Of course I was 12. I didn't know that's what was going on. I started to feel good and I went with it. Um, You're not the first person I've heard who said they didn't like eating pizza the first time they tried it because mozzarella cheese, any cheese is stinky and smelly. (laughs) It requires a special palate. It's def you know, it is definitely an acquired taste. Like I, I could never get into the blue cheeses to me that just never appealed. But I I remember even string cheese. I didn't like the texture and like ripping it. But, you know, after a while, it just felt like if everyone's doing it and everyone says it's good for me, it must be good for me. So let me try to nudge myself along and I see an acquired taste. The sad thing, something I say a lot is that humans can be taught to like to eat anything. 
Yeah. R- literally. And it's been done. And a lot of it isn't good for us. So there yeah. we are. That's, you know, that's so true. We often think that we have to acquire a taste for healthy food, but yeah, we do have to acquire a taste for some of these unhealthy foods too. Mm-hmm. That's not what we naturally like. E- even right. for me, meat. I, I remember thinking I should eat hot dogs because other teenagers were eating them and I really didn't like anything about it. And I would make myself like it thinking, you know, I'm going to be mm-hmm. a cool teenager eating like everyone else. And now I can't imagine feeling that way, but that was my mindset back then. All right. So I want to get into your training a little bit and your experience. You and you practiced internal medicine with Kaiser Permanente. Mm-hmm. And I remember maybe it was a decade ago that this article came out where Kaiser Permanente was actually going to encourage plant-based diets among their physicians. Did that happen? And did that impact you? Where were you at the time? Yeah, so I was working in the Washington, D.C. area at, at Kaiser Permanente, and I, uh, I learned about a program that, um, that Craig McDougall had done with Kaiser Permanente in the Washington area. I think it was Port in Oregon, mm. and it was a plant-based program to encourage people, and I really liked the sound of that, so I... Um, took the initiative and spoke to my team and they were very supportive and we launched the program. And, uh, you know, what was really amazing was how much interest there was amongst the patients. Mm. They really wanted it. We called it our plant-based weight loss program and people really struggle with losing weight and they were open to trying it. They, Mm. it made sense to them. And we had hundreds of people come in, come through the program. And, and my favorite part was when someone who had never even had tofu before and was like, Oh, what is tofu? Then a few weeks later, they would be raving about their favorite tofu recipe. So it was just really amazing to see the transformation in people. And it happens over and over again, everywhere. We've all somehow been brought to this space manipulated to consume things that aren't good for us. They're not good for animals. They're not good for the planet. And then some of us, the lucky ones get on a path to, or get on a path that kind of maybe brings us back to where Mm -hmm. we're supposed to be eating healthy, whole food, plant, plant, strong, plant-based plant foods. I want to know more about the Barnard Medical Center. I know Dr. Neil Barnard. I've talked to many people at PCRM. I've been a vegan for like, it seems like centuries, 33 years. And I've been following all of their wonderful work. And I remember when the Barnard Medical Center started. And I just wonder, what is it like there? What's different about it than other places if I'm a patient? Yeah, well... The first difference you'll notice when you walk in is in the exam uh, is in the waiting room. There is a big bowl of fruit there. Um, so we'll have apples and oranges and bananas and um, and there are all sorts of uh, helpful pamphlets about the importance of healthful eating and then um, and really everyone is on board with plant-based eating. so everyone is working together mm-hmm. to help our patients. And I think just that fruit bowl sets the tone. So people know, you know, people get hungry, they're waiting for their provider or they fasted for their labs. And it's nice Mm. that they have a healthy snack to reach out for. Uh, So it's, it's really a unique place uh, where we really emphasize nutrition. And do most people coming know what you're about? Yeah, I would say it's a mix. So some people come to us specifically because they know who we are, they are familiar with our work, and they want to see us. Um, And especially when the pandemic started, Mm. we really expanded telehealth. So for example, Mm -hmm. I'm licensed in 11 states now. So I see people in California, Florida, Texas, uh, everywhere. And, And it was a really a great way to connect with people. And they were so appreciative that they could find a plant-based provider to support them because it's been hard for them to find someone. Um, but then some of our patients come because they really don't know what we do. Um, they found us through their insurance company or mm-hmm. they liked our profile and they give us a try. And then they're pleasantly surprised to learn that, you know, they get so much more of the visit than just a traditional um, office visit. 
So I'm just imagining what a prescription might look like where you're saying eat so many servings of fresh fruit and take two green juices a day and (laughs) come back in two weeks. Do you ever do anything like that? We actually have a really cute prescription pad where we can write something like that, you know, this many (laughs) Today. I love that. It's just such a fun thing to do. And, and people really do appreciate it because they, most people really don't want to take medication. They want to know how they can be healthy just by changing their lifestyle. So they, they like that we're in tune with that, you know, that, that we are ready to support them through that journey. Well, I'm excited to hear that you've done a lot of telehealth and that the Barnard Medical Center is available that way. If ever I have a problem, I may look you up. Yeah, we I think we're seeing patients now in 17 states. A lot of us who are eating a healthy whole food plant diet, when things happen to us where we need a medical doctor, we want to have somebody who's at least where we are (laughs) when it comes to nutrition. And you don't want to have to explain yourself and you want somebody who's supportive. So it's good to know you're out there for so many people. Yeah, we are. And with telehealth, I think it's been really with this pandemic, if there's been any kind of a silver lining, it's been that we've really been able to harness technology to do a lot of outreach to patients in the community in a way that we weren't even thinking of before. Uh, so we were using telehealth before, but then we it just became such an integral mm-hmm. part of how we provide care. And it's been wonderful. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, who don't want to go to the doctor for one reason or another, going to a doctor can be intimidating for many people. Mm -hmm. Somehow meeting someone on a screen when you're in your own home is an easier way to do that. Yeah. It's, you know, it's also kind of practical sometimes. Like I'll have patients just run up to their fridge and pull out something they're eating and say, what do you think? Is this okay for me? So it's, (laughs) it's also very convenient because they, these are real time questions they have and we can just address it right then and there. That's fabulous. You've written a number of books, vegan style and stronger with plants. I will admit I have not read those books, but I think I need to know about them, especially vegan style. Yeah, so uh, so vegan style was my first foray into writing a cookbook, and it was really a collection of my family's favorite recipes. And it all started when I was doing the weight loss program with Kaiser, and I saw that there were all these patients that really wanted to eat better and change their health but they truly felt lost about how to put together a meal. And they thought eating plant-based meant eating a salad or just a bowl of lentil soup. And, you know, they weren't getting that excited. And I thought, oh my gosh, if I could just bring you into my kitchen and show you how much (laughs) great food there is to pick from, um, maybe this wouldn't feel so challenging. And that was my inspiration to write the book. And, uh, uh, and then uh, the new book, Simply Plant-Based is, is really uh, the new and improved version of that. With, oh, okay, uh, good. Yeah, newer, more updated recipes. Um, you know, just I feel like I'm always refining my recipes. It's mm-hmm. just part of the creative process. So uh, I think it's it's just a great way for people to jump into plant-based eating. Well, as I mentioned, I've been doing this for 33 years, 33 years vegan and even longer as a vegetarian. And I'm constantly redefining and refining the way I eat and the way I prepare foods. We're always learning and I always want to do what's best. And what I thought was healthy 30 years ago may not have been as good for me as I thought. And so we're constantly always upgrading. I can see that. So we have simply plant-based fabulous foods for a healthy life. Mm -hmm. And uh, in it, you talk about a lot of things, myths that people have, and and you give a lot of straightforward information. Who is this for? When I looked at it, it was for somebody who's new to this, pretty much, who's just jumping Uh, in, right? uh, Not necessarily. So it's for anybody who really wants to eat better and improve their health. So that could be someone who is curious about plant-based eating, who hasn't really tried it, but don't really, you know, they may not know where to begin. So this is a good way to get started. But it could also be for people who maybe are used to eating plant-based, 
um, but are really wondering, you know, um, am I putting together meals in the healthiest way that I could? Mm. Uh, what could I be doing differently? What, what else can I try to make them healthy? So definitely for that too. And then it's always fun to just try out new recipes, new Absolutely. ways of creating things. So someone who's just looking for something different on their plate. In this plant-based food movement, there are many shades, many shades of green <laughs> or many shades of the way people eat plant-based. And I think for the most part, the foundation is, is the same for most groups, but we, we vary on subtle little differences. And sometimes it can make people really angry on these little minute things that we, that we argue about. But what I want to talk about is oil, sugar, and salt. Mm -hmm. SOS, sugar, oil, salt. There are some people that have SOS free, oil, sugar, salt free. Uh, some people really think that olive oil is just amazing and we should be drinking gallons of it. <laughs> and there are many, there's a wide range. And in your book, when I look through the recipes, it looks like you do use a small amount of oil, maybe a little bit of salt, maybe a little bit of sweetener. What are your feelings about sugar, oil, and salt? Yeah, so let's. First, let's define what these things are. Um, so I think that sugar, people may think sugar is basically, I don't think of sugar as just table sugar. I think of sugar as anything that's an added sweetener. Mm -hmm. So it comes in many forms. It comes in table sugar. It comes as agave syrup or maple syrup or date sugar or palm sugar, uh, molasses. Uh, you know, the, the list goes on and on. What they all have in common is they're just nothing but a sweetener. They don't necessarily have a nutritional value. One is not necessarily better than the other. They're just there for one reason and one reason only to sweeten our food. So do we need them? Absolutely not. We do not need them. Uh, but we like them, you know, um, <laughs> some people like a little bit of sweetener in their tea or coffee, or they like... Um, their baked goods to be a little bit sweet. So I think the key there is to really minimize it, you know? So if often what shocks me is lately how sweet baked goods are, how much added sugar they have. So I was, I love to travel and I was sitting in Hong Kong once and I was enjoying this little cookie. And I, what struck me was it was almost not even sweet. Mm -hmm. And I thought, is this even a sweet cookie or is it savory? And, and it occurred to me how sweet our desserts have become in the U.S. So we can really dial down how much we're adding. And that's what I do in the book is, you know, we really need to reduce it. So you do not need these added sweeteners, but they do enhance the flavor. And what I would hate is for someone to not use them to be super strict and then just hate eating healthily and then just quit altogether. Mm -hmm. Because that's really not what we want. Eating is on a spectrum, standard American diet to this whole food, healthy, plant-based diet. And the closer we can be to that, the better it is. Ideally, we're all right there at whole food, plant-based. But if a little sweetener is going to help us stick with it, I think that's okay. It's better to just give up and then go back. You know, it's better than giving up and going back to the traditional way. Um, now let's Talk about salt. I think that's another one that causes a lot of confusion. When most people think of salt, they think of table salt, but then there's also rock salt and sea salt, and they're all salt. One is not better than another. There's coconut aminos or soy sauce. Uh, again, these are all basically some form or another of a salt flavor that we're adding to our food. Do we need it? No, absolutely not. We don't need it, but it does flavor our food. And again, just like with added sweeteners, we really want to minimize it. Um, the other confusion I think that comes in with salt is confusing salt with sodium. And what we really want is to minimize our sodium intake um, because it's sodium that contributes to high blood pressure and health problems. But table salt is just one source of that sodium. Uh, you know, the majority of the sodium in our diet is not coming from the table salt we're cooking mm. with. It's 
coming from restaurant food. It's coming from processed food. And, and it's not because those foods are necessarily high in salt, but they're high in other additives like dill conditioning agents, leavening agents, texture modifying agents that have a lot of sodium in them. So that's why I think we have to be very careful distinguishing salt and sodium. And what I often see is people with high blood pressure saying, okay, I'm going to stop all the salt and my blood pressure will be better. And now they're miserable because they don't like the food because it has no salt, but yet their blood pressure isn't much better because they're still getting all that sodium from those other things. Mm. So we really need to be careful. Um, so that's the story on salt and <laughs> sugar. Um, then the O in SOS stands for oil. And I think we can say the same thing there. Oil is nothing but 100% fat. Uh, it can be extracted from a wide variety of vegetables, uh, olives, vegetables, um, you know, can be made from coconut, palm. The, the key there, again, is we don't need it. We don't need to cook with it. It is usually only used to enhance flavor. So what I recommend is really minimizing it. Um, again, in the book, there are some recipes where I do use oil and it's mostly just a spray to prevent mm -hmm. things from sticking, but you could avoid it altogether if you wanted to. You could use a vegetable broth or water. Um, sometimes I use it in the baking goods only because then they're moist as opposed to being dry and hard. But again, I minimize it. So we're talking maybe a quarter cup, not, not half a cup or even a cup. Um, and definitely I recommend not deep frying anything. Um, so I think Again, there's a spectrum. Standard American diet is very high in oil. Um, we want to go as low as we can, but I think a little bit is okay if we're being careful about it, if we're minimizing it, um, but also for avoiding those unhealthy oils like coconut oil and palm oil, which are really high in saturated fat. Very good. I want to know who is Asif? Oh, so that's, that's my uh, better half. That's my partner. And, and he took all the pictures. Of exactly. The Asif Raman did all of the photos. I had a feeling you were related somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Very nice. I, I like especially um, the photos of the, the different dips or condiments, mm -hmm. simple little colors in bowls like this creamy cilantro chutney mm -hmm. it just looks so lovely there this creamy green in a white dish and then right next to it is the restaurant style salsa another nice white dish with the bright red and little garnish of um green onions i'll have to admit that one of my favorites because i've made them before and yours is a variation of of a, a recipe that i'm familiar with are the um the blondies Mm -hmm. with, made with chick with with garbanzo beans yeah the chickpea blondies it's such an amazing recipe and it's only good ingredients and it makes such a wonderful treat i have so much fun making it because it's easy to make and i i just can't believe i can't believe well, i'm just nuts over legumes and beans and all the things <laughs> that they can do but when you can put them in a dessert and it tastes like a great treat that's just like amazing you know, what's really interesting about that is in a lot of cultures, legumes are commonly used for dessert. Uh, like in Japanese food, they make mochis with uh, these red beans. Uh, and um, in Chinese culture, they'll make these steamed dumplings, again, with red bean paste. Um, and I know in India, we make a lot of dessert with lentils and mm. even chickpeas. And so it's, it's actually not that common in the Western culture, but in many cultures it is. So it's really fun to sort of incorporate some of these, you know, non-traditional ingredients into desserts. And they're all probably a lot less sweet than American desserts. Well, they used to be. No, uh, I, yeah. I, I do fear that maybe at least in, in my culture in India, um, they are getting really sweet. Um, we're seeing some of the same issues there, but traditionally they weren't that sweet. Mm -hmm. And then of course, there are the many variations on hummus. Mm. And hummus is just such a wonderful food. Of course, the traditional hummus is made from hummus, which is garbanzo beans, <laughs> and then blended with 
lemon juice, tahini, traditionally olive oil, but we can leave that out. And yeah. uh, maybe a little salt if you feel like you need it, but you've got different variations here where you blend them with peas, you blend them with edamame, garlic, all good. Yeah. And the pea combination probably cuts back on, oh, um, no, you have peas with avocado with guacamole. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm thinking of. And that probably cuts back a little on the fat in the avocado, but still gives you that creamy greenness. Yes, absolutely. You know, avocado is one of those things that's super high in fat. It's about 70 to 80% fat. So if we mix it with peas, we can make this delicious dip and it's just great over toast. Um, Kids will just sort of gobble it up. And it's also a lot more filling because the peas are bringing a fair amount of protein, um, fiber into it. So just wonderful dish. Okay, very good. Well, I've enjoyed talking with you, Dr. Raman, and looking at your book. There are definitely Mm -hmm. some things in here I'm going to try. I'm so glad you're out there doing what you're doing because we need, all doctors should know about food, should know about nutrition, should know how to prepare food and help their patients move along to a healthy place using preventative medicine first. Yes. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a bit of a cliche, food is medicine, but it really is. I mean, it just captures it so well. I forgot to ask you, so maybe we could wrap up. What is your work with PCRM? So, uh, so I work at the Barnard Medical Center, which is affiliated with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And at the Barnard Medical Center, I provide patient care. But then on the Physicians Committee side, we do a lot of advocacy and education work. So, for example, I was in the middle of a research study, a plant-based weight loss research study that we had to put on hold during the pandemic. And we're hoping to resume that next year, early next year. But then we also do a lot of terrific group programs. Uh, When we put our study on hold, we realized there was still such a need for people who really wanted to lose weight, eat better. So we started an online plant-based weight loss program. And this is terrific. We meet uh, every Saturday via Zoom, and it's a 12-week program, and every week we cover a new topic. People Mm. get to connect with each other, ask questions. We do live cooking demos, and just really giving people that that sense of community that maybe they're not getting at home. They may not be getting the support. They may not have a place to take their questions to, so we provide that, and we do it um, through a Zoom meeting, and it works extremely well. And then we do a lot of other things. We do medical education for healthcare providers, for medical students. We Mm. hold an annual conference every year um, for healthcare providers. You know, we'll have nearly a thousand attendees to that. And we uh, hold other many more community-based events. So, you know, it seems like it's just a great way to really not only educate the public, but also the healthcare providers, because they're going to be at the front line when people come in with health issues and we want them to know how to respond. That's wonderful. Dr. Vanita Raman, thank you so much for joining me today and for talking about your book, Simply Plant-Based, Fabulous Food for a Healthy Life. Here's to you and your healthy life. Thank you so much. I said it before and I'll say it again. I'm always thrilled to speak with medical doctors who know how to cook and know how to cook healthy whole plant foods. So that was a delight. And that should be like a major requirement in medical schools. We'll get there. We're not there yet. We'll get there. Hey, Gary. Karen, art class. Welcome to It's All About Food. Oh, I'm just so happy to be here. That was a great interview about a great book. Create delicious meals and live well. That's that's what's on the back cover of the book. Why not? You know, delicious. Gary, you always say that about responsible eating and living. You always say you can do this deliciously, deliciously. And that's why we're here. We can solve all the world's problems and do it deliciously. And you know, you've heard me say this like a lot this week. Yes. I've been saying, why doesn't everyone eat like we do? I know. <laughs> starting with your baked bagel. It's up on our website. It's so good. You went through several trials and you, like the true chemical engineer that you are, you finalized everything and posted it up on the website. And these bagels 
Again, a lot of people eat bagels, right? A lot of people yep. eat bagels that are heavy with all of the wrong things. They're all wheat-based. Right. Primarily, there are some gluten-free varieties out there, and wheat, wheat ideally isn't a bad food. Humans have survived on wheat in many areas all over the world for thousands of years. Wheat today, But the however, wheat was probably a lot better a thousand years ago. Yes, absolutely. And right, isn't that one of the reasons why wheat is now wreaking havoc on so many people and there are so many people that are gluten-free is because the wheat has been, as you would say, hybridized yes. and it has glyphosate. Yes, and glyphosate it has is used to... Round up ready residues. Dehydrate. And it's used as a desiccant. Right. So there's all kinds of bad wheat. stuff in conventional wheat. So, yeah. so we try and stay away from it. We try and stay away from it. And yet we still like the taste of bagels. At least I do. Yeah, I stopped eating bagels, I don't know, 20 years ago. And this bagel, I think Vanita Raman would approve of this bagel. <laughs> Dr. Vanita Raman would approve of this bagel. She would put it in her next cookbook. She would like it so much. Well, this is just my opinion. Thank you, Gary. Yes, it's yeah. delicious. And it's up on our website, responsibleeatingandliving.com. And I'm just wondering, I scanned the book, Simply Plant-Based, Fabulous Food for a Healthy Life by Vanita Raman. And I'm wondering... If she has a ramen recipe. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Uh, I thought that too. <laughs> well, let's get on that, Vanita. Vanita Ramen's ramen. I can see it. You know, ramen, the next ramen. book. Yeah. The, the ramen ne- is spelled differently as the of name. Of course. But it's, it's a play on it words. It needs to be done. That was in honor of your father, the late, great Harold Hartglass. But I digress. Continue but, on. Okay. So we're always talking about healthy, delicious food that's good for humans Gentle on the planet, kind to animals. Here, here. And speaking of animals. Yes. Let's talk about the ones that are in many people's homes. We can call them pets. Some people are elevating the word and calling these animals companion animals, right, right. which I like a lot, companion animals. And there's a new term that's been around for a while called the emotional support animal. Oh, okay. So I want to touch on a number of these things and then talk about what to feed these animals. Right. That that raises the question. Karen, you want everybody to go vegan. Does that include the emotional support animals that people live with? First, let's talk about what an emotional support animal is. We live in New York City. When I moved into this co-op apartment, one of the things that appealed to me was it was a no pet building. Right. I have nothing against dogs and cats and turtles and birds and whatever animals. I know you don't. You love all want animals. To live with, I think that non-human animals belong in their own wild habitat. Sure, in a perfect world, that's where they would still be. But we now we don't live in a perfect. We world. now have a lot of animals that need us to care for them because we've domesticated them, and then a lot of them have ended up on the street and they have no place to go and we need to take care of them. But this building is a no pet building. There have been some people that have been taking advantage of the law that supports having an emotional support animal. So let's just talk about the emotional support animal, ESA. And if you have one, I hope that it's doing what you intended to do, which is provide relief to people who have a variety of different mental challenges. It could be a a psychiatric disability, could be anxiety, and so many people have anxiety today. And the research is really, really compelling. The research shows that people with an emotional support animal, in one study in particular, 99.29% of the people that had an emotional support animal had heightened feelings of confidence and were compelled to participate in more physical activity. Wow. There's tons of these studies. So a relationship with a non-human animal can be very beneficial. Okay, excellent. I want to acknowledge that. That's really important. Well noted. Also, if someone needs an animal to guide them, a guide dog, for example. Absolutely, for the blind. Absolutely. We have nothing, no problem with any of this. And of course, we want to treat these animals with the respect that they deserve because they're doing a tremendous service. And we want to feed them well. Exactly. And that brings us to pet food. Right. Now, just like human food, there are many brands of pet food that are processed, highly processed. Highly. Highly processed. In fact, many of them contain ingredients that they wouldn't even approve for human consumption. It's a lot of waste. 
It's a lot of garbage. Yes, and, and if I had a pet, I would not want my pet to any, eat anything that I wouldn't eat. But now that I'm a vegan, how would I feed my exactly. pet? Exactly. Would I, would I buy meat for my pet? So that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of happy that we aren't Don't. allowed to have pets because I wouldn't want to buy meat for my pet and I wouldn't want my pet to be sick by me not giving it meat. So can you help me out here? If I'm not going to tell people what to do. This right. is this is a personal let's, choice every Let's do time. this hypothetically. Let's say I'm a vegan and I'm I'm against buying meat for myself, sure. so I I don't want to buy it for my my pet. Am I doing my pet any harm? For example, dogs and cats. Well, dogs are a really good example. Okay. Now, there are pet foods out on the market that are pretty good that are made with wholesome ingredients for the most part. But I want to bring up one case. Okay, this is one case, but there was a dog named Bramble. Once upon a time, there was a dog, a Welsh collie named Bramble. She lived to 25 years old. And at the time, her death was the world's oldest bitch. Wow. I'm uncomfortable using that word, but that word means female dog. Bramble made it to the Guinness Book of World Records. Okay. And was listed as one of the oldest living dogs. The special thing about Bramble, Bramble was raised on a vegan diet. What? There is evidence, at least with Bramble, <laughs> that dogs can live a very long, healthy life. Of course, you have to be careful. Just like with humans, we need to be careful with what we eat. We don't want to be living on Coca-Cola and French fries. And right. dogs need nutritious food, too. And dogs' needs for nutrition are different than humans. And you need to be aware of that. It's possible that a dog could live a happy, healthy dog life. As a vegan. As a vegan. And I know many people who have vegan dogs. Oh, okay. Great. So then we come to cats. Now, cats, that's a different story, cats right? Are, cats are complicated because cats are what are considered obligate carnivores. Obligate. Obligate carnivore. Something to do with obligatory carnivore. Yeah, it's... It's assumed. Assumed. It's assumed that they have to consume flesh. They have to consume meat. It's assumed that they have to consume. And I want to bring this up because there are very few articles. There is very little research on the best diet for a dog or a cat. We're still struggling with what the best diet is for humans. And there's been a lot of research on human diet. Well, right, but we know for sure that if dogs and cats were left to their own devices, they'd be out in the wild and they'd be hunting and gathering their own food. And sure. for the most part, they would pounce on something smaller and rip it apart and eat Probably. it. Probably. But now we're talking about domestic domesticated animals. domesticated yeah. animals and we are putting sweaters on our animals <laughs> we're putting little rubber boots on them i love when you walk in the city and you see people walking their dogs in the rain and they have little raincoats and little little boots and things so we're basically you know domesticating our dogs and cats so there have been a few articles in the medical literature in the veterinary medical literature, there's one journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association. They had an article in 2015, and they assessed the protein and amino acid concentrations and labeling adequacy of commercial vegetarian diets formulated for dogs and cats. Well. Wow. And they were comparing what was in these different products based on their understanding of what these animals need. Right. And I'm I've got quotes on everything because I don't think we know the ultimate. Now, the conclusion was that most diets assessed in this study were not compliant with what they call the Association of American Feed Control Officials. Wow. They have an acronym, AAFCO, Association I of American Feed Control love acronyms. Officials. And according to them, the diets were not compliant with what this group labels and regulates. And there were concerns regarding the adequacy of the amino acid content. Where do they get their protein? Exactly. So <laughs> Even dogs. Excuse me, you're going to feed me this vegan diet, but where am I going to get my protein? I'm not going to argue about this. I'm sure that many of the products that are out on the market are not ideal. Right. And they may be lacking. But if and, you... But they're saying, they're saying the vegetarian ones were lacking. Okay. And this is what's key. Because there are these different amino acid requirements, four of them, leucine, methionine, methionine, cysteine, and taurine that were specifically below their requirements and definitely necessary. But then, this is why I'm bringing this up. 
But then there's Bramble. Right. Well, we're really concerned about the cats because the cats have a greater amino acid requirement that is believed you can only get from animal foods. Although there are synthetic versions of these amino acids. So there are some people feeding cats vegan diets and supplementing what they believe is lacking. But this is what I wanted to bring up. There was a study that came out earlier this year, 2021. And I'm not saying it was an ideal study. There are lots of things people could say is wrong with it. But I'll tell you what they did. They did a questionnaire and they got 1,325 questionnaires that were complete enough to be included in the study. That's a lot. Now it's a questionnaire. So you have to trust every applicant who filled out those questionnaires. And the cats filled out these questionnaires? <laughs> Sorry. 1,300 cats filled out this questionnaire. Meow, 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 meow. <laughs> And according to this study, most cats, 65% represented, were fed a meat-based diet. And 18.2% were fed a plant-based diet. And it was interesting because they didn't really see a difference in lifespan. Cat age ranged from 4 months to 23 years, a medium, median of 7 years, and was not associated with diet type. There were no differences in reported lifespan detected between diet types. Fewer cats fed plant-based diets reported to have gastrointestinal and hepatic disorders, which are some of the concerns that some veterinarians have with cats going on vegan diets, having some sort of gastrointestinal disorder. Cats fed plant-based diets were reported to have more ideal body condition scores than cats fed a meat-based diet. More owners of cats fed plant-based diets reported their cat to be in very good health, very good health. And the conclusion they had is that cat owner perception of health and wellness of cats does not appear to be adversely affected by being fed a plant-based diet. Contrary to expectations, owners perceive no body system or disorder to be at particular risk when feeding a plant-based diet to cats. This study collected information from cat owners and is subject to bias as well as methodological limitations. Further research is warranted to determine if these results are replicable in a prospective investigation. Well, how about that? I'm not saying that this study is the be-all, end-all. It just sparks enough curiosity that I think, as they say, further study is warranted. Well, we want to take care of our pets. This is something to consider because a lot of that food, as you said, a lot of that pet food is not good for them. Right. So let's talk about the pet food that's out on the market. A lot of it has animal products in it, obviously. Right. right? And we know where they come from. They're products that come from animal agriculture. Some people call it factory farms, confined animal feedlot operations, all those places where they raise animals in filthy conditions. And then what doesn't go to humans for consumption goes everywhere else. They use, I've heard the expression when it comes to a pig, they use everything but the squeal. Oh, that's terrible, right? Right. And oh. some of it goes into pet foods. And there's been a lot of cancer. In dogs. In dogs, in pets. And some of it has to do with what we're feeding them. It's just like with humans. We right. feed ourselves food that isn't good for us and we get disease. Same That's thing. They're not immune. So a lot of people are concerned about this and they're researching and many people feed their dogs whole minimally processed plant foods just yes. like they eat. And they do a lot of cooking for their dog. I know a lot of people who feed their dogs broccoli. I remember <laughs> you had Eunice Wong on this program and on her Facebook page. I'm not sure if Eunice is, if Eunice's dog is vegan, but I see her feeding her dog broccoli all the time. And she says she loves, her dog loves broccoli. Mm. Now so, cats are a little more difficult. Yeah. And I think it's really hard to change a cat's diet once they're used to eating certain foods. You might have better luck starting with a kitten. But, but we, should we be experimenting with our cats and our dogs? And that's the question, I guess. Do people want to, you know, switch diets on a dog or a cat if they don't know a lot? No, so. I'm not making any recommendations. I'm just reporting some things that I've read, and I have this dreamlike wish for this ideal society where not only do humans live in peace, but the lion will lie down with the lamb. Right. And all animals will not need to kill each other. I know. These are the things that I think about. Right. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I've read that certain animals have evolved 
to eat a certain kind of diet. Right. So I don't think anything will happen overnight, but we can evolve to another place. And, and I hope it's a more peaceful place. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. You know, I walk a lot and so do you. We walk through New York. We walk all over. And I've noticed more and more lately that people are feeding pigeons. Mm. They are laying down lots of food in areas where there are pigeons living, like under an overpass. A uh, Lots of pigeons like... And so today I was walking under an overpass... And I saw someone dumped an entire crate of apples and the pigeons were, oh. were happily pecking away at the apples. And I wow. thought, well, this is good. Feeding them apples is a good thing. How do you feel about feeding the birds in New York City? Feed the birds, top and so bad. Uh, see, I wanted, you to, I wanted to get you to sing. And I knew if I said, how do you feel about feeding the birds? You would go into the bird lady from Mary Poppins. Well, I was also thinking of a song that goes, we're poisoning pigeons in the park. Right, Tom Lair. <laughs> but, yeah, that could have been. No, I doubt that was a poison apple because there were lots of apples and the pigeons seemed perfectly happy eating those apples. But here's my point. Lying next to this beautiful display of apples was what looked like, and I'm not sure, I, I didn't stare at it long enough, looked like a brain. It looked like mm -hmm. a brain of a, like a cow or a human. I mean, it was really, really scary. Yeah. And no pigeons were going around this thing that looked like a brain. I don't know, early Halloween present for all of you out there, <laughs> but someone is feeding pigeons, possibly, someone is possibly feeding pigeons body parts. No! <laughs> <laughs> no. Speaking of Halloween, you like that segue? Beautiful. That's coming up. Do you think people will be trick-or-treating this year? Or do you think everyone's going to stay home again? Oh, that's a really good question because last year it was pretty quiet, right? Last year, I didn't see any trick-or-treaters. Yeah. If you are going trick-or-treating, what do you hope to get this Halloween? I know what I hope to get. I hope to get some Pasha chocolate. Oh, yeah. That's our favorite. That's the one we always buy. It's organic and it has like... Nothing in it. <laughs> Nothing in it. Not <laughs> it has, even chocolate. It has no allergens in it. But it's also... Or none of the most popular allergens. It's also fair trade. It also has all kinds of... It has this little... all of, Like this entire row of little, little emblems that make it all of these different things. And one of the emblems I didn't recognize. It was spelled U-T-Z. So it's even UTS approved. And if you know what that means... <laughs> I thought Utz was a brand of, like, uh, potato chips or something. But this chocolate is Utz approved. Everybody has put their stamp on this chocolate. And we need to talk about chocolate, especially with when we're talking about Halloween. Because there's a dark side of chocolate. Ah, we dark chocolate. <laughs> we did a video on chocolate a few years ago. It's still quite relevant. And unfortunately, most of the major brands today get their cocoa beans that have been harvested by children slaves right. in the Ivory Coast. And we don't want to support that, do we? No, we don't. So our best choices are organic chocolate, organic fair trade. And you can always go over to the Food Empowerment Organization and check their chocolate lists and make sure your favorite brands are on their approved list. Yes. And one of my reasons for bringing this up is we do not want to put our dogs in front of the candy dish because mm. chocolate is poisonous to dogs, mostly because of theobromine mm. content. So if we're going to be talking about dogs on this program and Halloween, we have to also bring up that chocolate is poisonous to dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should go as a cat this Halloween and I should go as a dog. <laughs> 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 We spent a lot of time making all kinds of animal noises here at Responsible Eating and Living Headquarters. Because we love animals, and that's the reason, the main reason we're all vegan here at Responsible Eating and Living, is because we love animals. And just because we say we love animals doesn't mean we want to live with them. No. We just want no. them to live their lives. But thank you to the people that do peace. take care of the animals and bring them into your homes and give them little rubber boots and little raincoats and little sweaters and feed them wonderfully clean diets. 
of non-processed foods, right? Right. It's really... That's just about it. So Gary, we, how was your Indigenous People's Day yesterday? There's a lot of talk about Indigenous People's Day. Well, I don't celebrate Columbus Day. I celebrate Indigenous People's Day. But I do celebrate my Italian heritage, which is also tied in with the month of October, Italian Heritage Month. So I made pasta. That's how I celebrated. Mm. I made a a pesto pasta and celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day by eating a dish that my Italian ancestors taught me how to make. It was delicious, Gary. And you could make that any time. So it was a spinach pesto. Mm-hmm. And we had some fresh spinach in the refrigerator, and I blended it with some garlic and some ground cashews. That was it. And a little bit of water. Water from the pasta that was boiling. Mm. And it made a creamy, amazing, creamy sauce. I didn't use basil. It was a spinach pesto. And the nut base or the oil that, you know, normally you drizzle tons of olive oil mm-hmm. into your pesto. Well, not tons, but you drizzle a lot of olive oil. I took a spice grinder and I ground some raw cashews. So I made it like, it looked like Parmesan. Then I added some nutritional yeast and these ground cashews and a little bit of the pasta water that was boiling. And it was great. Oh, and you mean you didn't blend the sauce in a blender? No. Because I, you've I, done that. I used before. the Cuisinart. Art. Uh, interesting. So it had that, like a Parmesan consistency, the cashews. Well, I actually used two blenders. I used a small spice grinder to get the the cashews nice and powdery mm-hmm. to match the nutritional yeast, which is also powdery. So then I mixed those two things together and made my own cashew Parmesan. And I added that to the Cuisinart with the spinach leaves and the garlic. And I whirled it, whirled it all together, processed it, and then streamed in a little hot pasta water, Mm. some pepper, and I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was fabulous. Wow. It's really good. We don't have that all the time, and it's always a treat when we do. And it was very green. It was very bright green. It was delightful. Now, some would say, why didn't you use basil? And it's not that we have anything against basil. Basil is a fantastically nutritious food. It's just when you don't have basil and you have spinach. No, I could have put some dry basil with the spinach, and but I wanted spinach pesto. It was it was fantastic. You don't just need to make pesto with basil, although people will argue with me, especially my ancestors. They will haunt me. <laughs> Speaking of Halloween, they'll come and haunt me now for not using basil. But a very California cuisine dish back in the days of California cuisine when it was first getting started was to make a spinach pesto. And they used a lot of, a lot of restaurants used walnuts, didn't use the pine nuts as is tradition. And that was very, you know, California cuisine, darling. I mean, right. There's a lot of variations on pesto, as you're mentioning. Well, if you're trying to go oil free, use nuts. So what I mean by oil-free is if you don't want to use processed oil. Like olive oil. Olive oil. Or, you know, a lot of folks use walnut oil in their pesto if they're doing a walnut pesto. Just use the nut and blend it with a little water. And it- So if you use walnuts, for example, yeah. it will have a very oily consistency. Yeah. Because when you blend walnuts, they get the oil comes out. You don't need all that oil. But if you use cashews, for example... You'll get a creamier consistency, a less oily consistency. Right. And if you want it to taste like olive oil, throw in some olives. Throw? Oh, yes. Genius. And olives have a little bit of salt. (laughs) Because you you notice I didn't talk about salt. So there's your salt right there. I use nutritional yeast, which has an umami. Umami. (laughs) Which has a, you know, a little hit of salt. It kind of tastes salty to me because I don't use a lot of salt anymore. So we're talking about theme and variation. Yeah. Theme and variation, and we're giving you permission to substitute. You know, this cashew pesto, this this, uh, this spinach pesto made with raw cashews is richer than if you were to make it with olive oil, in my mm. humble opinion. It's, it's very rich. And then sticking with this theme and variation idea, you can vary your nuts. You can even use seeds if you don't want to use Well, nuts. wait, hold, vary your nuts? What? <laughs> Sorry. And then terrible. you can vary your green. So I said we didn't use basil. Some people use arugula, arugula. pesto. Yeah. Some people combine arugula and spinach, just spinach. You've made it with kale and it's been Kale pesto is great. Anything green. Or for that matter, you don't have to use anything green if you don't want. But 
I think pesto is green as a rule. So yeah, any green. Yeah, you just mentioned arugula pesto. That's delightful. Or if you don't want to process it, just saute the spinach, make the pasta, and toss it with the pasta, a little pasta water, and some garlic, and some umami nutritional yeast, and that's, that's good, good too. too. You don't even need a blender. <laughs> Add the greens to your pasta just like they are. It's Boy, if I didn't have a full stomach right now, I would say I'm going to get hungry just talking about this stuff. So that's what I did yesterday to answer your question to celebrate Indigenous People's Day. And I just want to end saying that I support Indigenous People's Day. So do I. Columbus Day was never really appropriate as the founder of this nation. There were many people who lived here before Columbus and all of his buddies came along. And we did some pretty awful things to yeah. the people that were living here first. Yes, we did. And um, now it's time to acknowledge them. And maybe this will help us become less exploitive in general. Yeah, I, I always felt like Kurt Vonnegut's quote about 1492 pretty much summed it up basically he writes as children we were taught to memorize this year with pride and joy as the year people began living full and imaginative lives on the continent of north america actually people had been living full and imaginative lives on the continent of north america for hundreds of years before that 1492 was simply the year sea pirates began to rob cheat and kill them. And again, that was Kurt Vonnegut. Mm. And I, I basically agree with that. So here's to equality. Here's to minimizing or getting rid of exploitation of humans and non-human animals and the planet. That's, that's, says that's, it, just, that's just it. That says it best. Better than Vonnegut. <laughs> no. Hard glass. <laughs> hard, hard glass needs to be quoted. Thank you. Gary. Wait. Karen. Great Gary, to see you. Great to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody, have, have a, a delicious, delicious week. week.